Uh, so we'll transition from the world of repair to the world of replacement. And this talk is titled TTVR, the new TAVR. And uh, as you'll see, this is kind of a tongue in cheek statement. So let me just go ahead and share my screen so I can show you my slides. Uh, hopefully those are transmitting well. If they're not, just let me know. Okay. Uh, so here are my disclosures. Uh, I am going to be talking about how TTVR is the new TAVR, but in the case that they're both heart valves, inserted in percutaneously potentially with three leaflets and there in the similarities end. So the quagmire is that severe TR is obviously vastly undertreated, more out of mind than out of sight. It's a large historical issue with the reluctance to treat it, increased in hospital mortality, particularly following left-sided cardiac surgery. Percutaneous therapies are a challenge due to the anatomy. Tricuspid leaflets are thinner and more fragile, high cortal density and RV trabeculation challenge navigation. RV dimensions can be small, limiting throw into the RV. Lack of calcium can present ceiling problems. The annulus is dynamic, as Matt pointed out in his talk, and we're limited by our imaging. TE is particularly challenging because of the anterior orientation of the tricuspid valve. So um, this is a proposed uh, of standard echocardiographic tricuspid valve nomenclature by Becky Hahn and colleagues, as Matt kind of discussed as well. And obviously it's much more uh, complex than anything that we have in the aortic uh, valve world. So we're entering into a minefield. When we're talking about transeptal, or sorry, not transeptal, transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement, there is no transeptal support, and the distance between the IVC and the tricuspid annulus can be quite short. Several surrounding structures can be at risk, the AV node, the right bundle of Hiss, the RCA, the non-coronary sinus of Alsalva, the coronary sinus ostium. Many patients have pre-existing pacemakers and ICD leads. Our case here, I wanna show you just to elaborate on the complexity here, 91 year old female, severe functional TR, permanent AFib, an eloquous history of a mechanical MVR, chronic diastolic heart failure, history of breast cancer, STS bridge risk mortality of repair, mitral valve repair is 18%, tricuspid valve repair is not in the STS uh, database as far as calculations concerned. So we evaluated for one of our clinical trial platforms, the Medtronic Intrepid TTVR that I'm gonna go through in just a second. She initially screen failed secondary to a poor creatinine clearance, but eventually was accepted four months later after the creatinine clearance uh, criteria were revised to GFR. And so we can see here where this jet is coming from, and it's basically commissure to commissure, commissure to commissure, uh, really just very centralized, but assume, expanding into the commissures of the tricuspid valve space. And on the scale of being massive torrential, sorry, torrential massive severe, we're probably severe to massive with regards to the amount of TR here. And so uh, 0.5, 4, 5 centimeters squared on the PISA uh, as far as the um, 3D assessment was concerned. RV dysfunction was just mild uh, with a relatively preserved TAPSI. We CT size all these patients, obviously. CT uh, sizing of the tricuspid annulus can be quite complex. Uh, you can see the oversizing here that we're willing to accept for a 48 millimeter device is on the verge of true sizing or slightly undersized. And so you can see here the maximum diameter of 46.2, minimum diameter of 40.3. CT sizing in the RV. And so the length of the right ventricle definitely matters. Um, you know, we're concerned about injury, pseudoaneurysms, perforations, things of that nature. And here things look very good. Obviously, the minimum and maximum view. Uh, this trial was actually halted in the early term, secondary to incidents of those types of events. And those have been largely resolved with the refined criteria to assess um, the depth or length of the right ventricle. We look at access, we're looking at venous access, obviously, and the capacitance of a 42 French outer diameter system or a 39 French outer diameter system up from the groin area into the IVC. Sheath to femoral vein ratio is something that we look at. The average perimeter here is about uh, 0.82 uh, for the 37 French, and that's deemed to be suitable for our transfemoral venous access. So this device is a dual stent frame device. There's this outer stent frame that kind of conforms to the anatomy that's 42 or 48 millimeters in diameter. The inner stent frame is 27 millimeters in diameter. And so there are some considerations here to be aware of. Uh, you can see here that we've got dense coral structures, IVC TV, annulus distance trajectory issues, RV length, RV size, variable TV, annulus dimensions, Horizontal hard axis can present some orthogonal challenges or being able to lie this valve perpendicular, some anatomic shadowing as well. And so here we look at the delivery system, uh, the cradle and stool, which is off the shelf, sheath and step, step up dilators uh, as being kind of part and parcel of how we do this procedure. 
And so to move on to some of the NPR rendering and 3D imaging, you can see us here coming in uh, by the SVC and the right atrium with this device that basically has a brim structure to it that we then lower down to the annular plane and we complete rapid pacing to deploy the brim just for sake of time. I won't go through this in too much detail, but you can see here with the 3D and NPR assessments of what we're actually doing. When we go to deploy this valve, and again, I'll kind of fast forward here just to show you what happens, uh, that it's a hydraulic end deflator, the valve gets deployed, and at the point of deployment, we look pretty good, but when we release the brim of the valve, um, and, and the actual internal fixation of the valve, uh, we do see a little bit of kick up on that posterior aspect of the valve. Um, and what you'll see here is basically that we've caught basically the annular plane with the lower set of cleats, but that the valve is basically migrated out a little bit. And this is obviously concerning. When we go to our color Doppler here, you're gonna see there's a tremendous amount of color flow here indicating significant paravalvular regurgitation. And so this is definitely an issue. So now what? We think about the Super Bowl, we think about the Eagles pushing uh, their, their quarterback, Jalen Hurts, into the end zone, and that's exactly what we elected to try to do. Uh, so we definitely jam this capsule of the device between the inner and outer stem frame to basically try to move this device in more to an annular level. And uh, what we accomplish with that is actually pretty good. Uh, so we go from here to here. And so we do shut down paravalvular regurgitation to a certain degree. But unfortunately, when we, uh, when we move back the capsule, we end up with that same PVL jet that we did before. A patient wasn't really tolerating this very well. Uh, and, and this was not a suitable surgical candidate. So what did we elect to do? We like to put in a 29 millimeter Sapien 3. And these are kind of like the, um, not in the textbook, uh, kind of creative solutions that we're gonna have to think about in this era. And so here we elect for 29 millimeter Sapien 3 to be deployed a little bit more in the ventricle. And by deploying this, we cut off that PVL jet, as you see here on color, just a very mild amount of PVL remainder. Uh, and so we get a pretty good outcome there. All right, so our peri and post procedural follow up looks pretty good. Transthoracic echocardiography showing um, really good solutions uh, with regards to what we had employed. Um, so, really, just trivial PVL left over and a good tricuspid valve replacement in replacement. So, some final thoughts here. Uh, they do well in their preferred anatomies, but understanding what those anatomies are is a work in progress. This complex consists of a very flimsy valve, variably shaped annulus, sometimes dense chordal apparatus influenced through chamber, chamber dimensions and random trajectories, provided you could see it during the procedure at all. However, the patient population is plentiful, very much in need, and most are without any effective commercially available treatment. This field, more than any other, will require collaboration to build and refine an absolutely essential toolbox. So thanks so much. Here's my contact information. Appreciate your time. And without further ado, we can move on to the next talk, which is going to be about concomitant maze and left atrial appendage ligation, uh, heart valve surgery. Do not forget about AFib. We'll turn over to Dr. Chu. Thank you so much.